Alright, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ramblin, and I am a female to presenting male last 13 years on testosterone. And today I'm going to be reviewing a Michaela Peterson interview with Adam Omery. He's a Harvard neuroscientist. Uh, he did his PhD on gender dysphoria and intersex conditions. And I thought it was really interesting. Uh, this clip goes into the um, biological origins for gender identity, not just in trans individuals, but also just for everybody. I mean, we all have uh, sex or gender identity uh, that is developed uh, in utero from prenatal hormones. So uh, let's get into it and we'll do a little discussion during. But I think we should jump right in. We were talking about it for dinner last night. We we're talking about the famous twin study. So can you describe what that is? Dr. John Money was a famous psychologist and sexologist. He was one of the first people to really promote sex change surgery for transgender people and particularly for transgender kids. So this was happening in the 1950s and 60s and beyond. And it was coming off of this blank slatist social constructivist view to gender. So we didn't know as much about genetics or how sex hormones mm -hmm. influence brain development during cri critical windows prenatally are yeah. the first early signs of sex differentiation. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think it's interesting how both sides of the, de of the debate um, today is focusing on social constructionism instead of the biological reasons. On the trans activist side, you know, they're all about gender's social construct and that you can kind of define it for yourself and masculinity and femininity, femininity, you can um, also, you know, redefine that and it's kind of arbitrary. And on the anti-trans uh, front, they talk about how we're delusional and that it's, uh, you know, from social contagion and um, trauma and things that are more socially determined, which I don't deny that there are some cases of people that choose to transition uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, but yeah, it's just, I love this type of stuff. This is the type of uh, research and information that I look for um, in understanding my own case. And uh, for anybody who's new, I, I've said this uh, in previous videos, but my, um, sex dysphoria I believe was caused by my mom during uh, her pregnancy with me she had an ovarian cyst for six months of the nine months they had to remove it because it was getting so large it could have exploded and killed me but what ovarian cysts do is they release extra androgens in the prenatal environment and so those are basically male sex hormones so for six months of the pregnancy I was just kind of floating around in a bunch of male sex hormones and I believe that uh, wired my brain to um, not only be attracted to other females, but to um, perceive my own body to I was supposed to be male. That, that's how it feels. And uh, he kind of goes into describing some of these cases, uh, you know, what it kind of feels like. I mean, basically, if you just want to imagine, if you're a dude, just imagine at puberty, you went through a female puberty instead, and you grew breasts and, and all of that, and uh, how devastating that would feel, how uncomfortable that would feel. That's kind of what it feels like. Uh, so, all right, let's get back into it. So the theory was, in absence of all that, and knowing how powerful behaviorism was, how powerful social learning is, that all of these gender stereotypes that we see, and given that so many of them are culturally specific, we don't know if you were to raise a child of one sex completely as the opposite sex, everything, everyone was on board, and even their body, like if you did a sex reassignment surgery, if this genetic male child had a vagina and was raised as a girl all his or her life, then would they identify as a healthy, functional woman? And it was an open question, but there was enough of a theory to think that that's very well what will happen. Mm -hmm. So there have been various cases, but the ideal would be a twin study, like people with the exact same genetics, exact same environment, and you take one and raise them the opposite sex, but everyone knew it would be unethical. So it was pretty much a fluke that this perfect natural experiment came along. A set of twin boys born in Canada they had a circumcision, and one of the circumcisions was botched, and the boy's penis was destroyed. And because of this, they were referred to all sorts of medical specialists, including John Money. And just to point out that this type of situation where something happens at birth uh, from circumcision or a baby is born with unambiguous, unambiguous genitalia, the doctors uh, for a long time have just took it upon themselves to decide what gender the baby should be uh not understanding that gender is i mean you know if we're going to talk about brain sex if we're going to talk about uh the ba what is the baby going to identify as uh growing up so you could really mess um, somebody's life trajectory up by making that decision 
And the theory was, this was also based on Freudian psychoanalytic influence, thinking about sexual development being critical for healthy psychological development. So this thought of this boy growing up without a penis, he's going to be very insecure in his manhood. He's never going to have a functional sexual life. How's he going to get married? He's going to be depressed. Uh, he'd be way better off living as a woman. You know, we can construct a functional vagina. At the time, vaginoplasties had been developed, but it's much harder to construct an artificial penis, especially in a child. So the thought was, here's this perfect natural experiment. So you know, part of it, I think, was this authentic desire to promote what they thought would be the in the child's best interest. But the other part of it that certainly was in the back of John Money's mind is this is the perfect experiment to test my theory. Yeah, it's horrifying. So this <laughs> child was raised as a girl, Brenda, and her brother, Brian, was a typical healthy boy. And Brenda was very tomboyish. And at early ages, like before eight or so, experienced what we would now call gender dysphoria, but didn't really know how to say it other than I don't feel like other girls, was, but not was, just tomboyish. Was the kid told what had happened or did? Eventually. Eventually, not, not told, at that time? Okay. Not until he was 14. Wow. So he was tomboyish, but not just that, you know, because he was told, well, lots of girls are kind of more rough and tumble. They're into boys things. But he felt, no, it's not just that. It's like, I don't feel like I'm in the right body. And again, without really having the link. I just find it so interesting that a uh, natal male that doesn't know that he's male uh, is raised as a girl is having the same exact thought process and emotions that I had being myself a natal female. It, you know, just it, it's it's wild to to have that comparison, but it's a it is it's a great example of how again sex identity, gender identity, and I say sex identity more because gender tends to re refer more to uh, like personality traits and um, different ways of expressing yourself in a feminine or masculine way but when you sex identity is more of like the brain's mapping of what it what it perceives the body should be so just the the pure anatomy of the body of like before i had top surgery i've had top surgery for about eight years now i've never once looked back it's e it's even weird to think that i used to have boobs thank god they weren't uh very big but um but my brain it was just like after the surgery, I, I, I thought I was going to have this huge emotional release. And instead I just looked in the mirror and I'm like, yeah, that's it. Like my brain was like, all right, we're good now. Like it synced up and it was like, all right, we're good to go. It, it felt, it felt like I had the chest all along. It's a, a very interesting experience, but anyways. Which for that. And he's told this to his doctors, but John Money turned out to be quite biased. So in all of the papers that were published, at the time, in that first decade or two, you hear nothing but a success story of, look, there's twins, he was born a male, now he's living as a healthy girl, so feminine you wouldn't believe it, wears dresses, says he's a girl, everything like that. Wow. But experiencing gender dysphoria and depression. Uh, so I think that um, my mom and my aunt, my one aunt in particular, they, they were so invested in me being a feminine girl that even though me and my mom fought all the time about me wearing feminine stuff, all they could see was what they wanted to see, which was, oh, look, she looks so pretty in a dress. And I mean, it's true. I think if the ovarian sister, whatever, hadn't been there, I could have well, very well ended up uh, being a typical straight, you know, female. And I think I would have done pretty all right because I was you know deemed pretty enough like except for the fact that i walked like a guy and people confused me for being a boy um even when i would dress up in more girly uh you know clothes and stuff so it's not just about oh i have a female body and a pretty face it's more of why you know i i if you look at female basketball players especially the more masculine like butch ones that's how i walked so imagine me in like a dress and makeup it's just awkward it's e it's awkward for a lot of like butch lesbians to have to go through that experience but um but yeah everybody else i mean it, people are invested in their own like projection of like who they want you to be and um you know for the women in my family they weren't when they were growing up uh my grandma was pretty strict because she was um abused and you know she didn't want them uh being seen as sexual objects of yeah, they weren't allowed to basically dress themselves until, until they were 18. So they were very much controlled in a similar way to how I was controlled, probably even more so, actually. Um, and so I think when my mom had me, she was like, oh, I get to live vicariously through my daughter and she's going to go get married and have the wedding and all that stuff. And I understand there's nothing wrong with that. It's just when you force somebody 
to do it, that's obviously the issue. Anxiety symptoms the entire time. And then once the puberty age comes along, well, it's not a girl, so he's not going to naturally go through puberty. So there's this critical juncture where you have to start taking estrogen. And they did give him estrogen for a brief time and started growing breasts. And then combined with the depression that she was already experiencing. And you see the pronouns are confusing. Like, know, I'm already going a bit back and forth between he and she. So this case isn't working. And so she gains a lot of weight in order to hide her breasts because she hates this female figure that the estrogen oh is developing and just starts to become suicidal. So finally, after all that and the trauma that it causes in this family. Yep, I can relate to that. The parents tell her, tell him what happened. And he said, suddenly it all clicked that I was born a boy. This is why I'm so much like my brother. It's not just that we're opposite sex twins and we share some interests. Like literally, we share all of our genes. I was meant to be a boy. And then you might think, OK, so gender identity is genetically ingrained. And actually, I should finish telling you about this story. So it's not a happy ending. Oh, no. So Brenda, after 14 or so, decides to live as a boy, stops taking the estrogen, starts taking testosterone, even gets surgery to construct a penis later, and renames himself David, David Reimer, and continues living as a man for another two decades or so, even gets married and has kids, but tragically ends in suicide. He struggled with depression his whole life. John Money, the sexologist, while doing these yearly check-ins that he would do with the twins, he'd show them porn, he'd ask them to strip down and do all sorts of weird tests. He was in this mindset that America is so Puritan and that we're so repressive in our attitude towards sex and we just need to liberate it. So for example, he thought that homosexuality, which at the time was still in the DSM as a mental disorder, he thought that it was a matter of children not being exposed to healthy sexual role models. So he also wow. encouraged David and Brian's parents to walk around nude and have sex in front of the children. They didn't do that. They drew the line there. But his theory, and when Brenda entered puberty, so she's still a girl before she knew what happened, she thought she was gay. She was attracted to other girls. So that's interesting. Genetically, is there something that sexuality encodes, whether it's you're homosexual or straight, it's completely dissociable from gender identity. So the twin study showed that as well. And John Money, you know, he was he was willing to admit that part, show that in some cases she's more tomboyish, maybe she's gay, but still she's what we would now call cisgender. It was a success in that regard. But he was so adamant that it must have been because... Yeah, I mean, that's another... Uh, I mean, John Money, that's obviously really messed up what he was doing with the kids. Um, and... You know, it was coming from again the faulty belief that it's social, it's socially constructed se sexuality and gender identity, which we're now finding is innate. Now, again, in some cases, are some people that um, identify as gay? Maybe it is caused by some trauma response. I think that's possible. I think there are people that are confused, uh, and I can relate to that because being forced into uh, I had uh, a couple of boyfriends growing up and it, it n didn't last long, but that, that like formative upbringing of people pressuring you to be, um, something that you're not, I could see how if somebody was in an environment where they were abused by like a same sex adult or, um, you know, cause in most cases uh, the, reverse is not true where a kid grows up in a family and they're forced to be gay that usually doesn't happen but i could see if they under certain circumstances if they were involved with a really abusive controlling um, predator of the same sex how they might end up associating that trauma with their own authentic sexuality and acting that out and reenacting it until they realize that this actually, you know, because when when trauma, sexual trauma happens to kids, you know, very young, um, it really can warp um, the the child's real sexuality uh, to that point. So, so I, I don't want to say that it, it never happens, but um, it doesn't change the fact that in a lot of these cases, um, that for in the case of like kids that are naturally um, like gay from a young age or you know, they're more likely to develop and grow up with and to have a gay identity So a lot of kids that are gender non-conforming boys that are more feminine girls that are more masculine. They are at a higher um, Likelihood of growing up to identify as that Because the parents had this unhealthy attitude towards sex the parents marriage really was falling apart ever since this botched circumcision ruined their family so John money's theory was 
Brenda's gay not because she was born a boy, but because she witnessed this unhealthy marital dynamic. Oh yeah, of course, blame the parents, rather than <laughs> thinking maybe, maybe he could be wrong. Blame the parents, yeah. right? So this makes us think, okay, now with modern knowledge of genetics, gender identity, and maybe sexual orientation, it must be genetic. And then in grad school, I learned about this intersex condition, complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. So the most extreme case of this, with complete androgen insensitivity, that means that you can produce androgens like testosterone, but the androgen receptor doesn't work, so it's functionally inert. So you can have a genetic male with a Y chromosome, and I didn't learn this until grad school either. The Y chromosome, what it really does, the SRY gene on the Y chromosome, produces testes determining factor, which is a protein that's used to construct the testes out of undifferentiated gonadal cells. So in the first six weeks of fetal development, the gonads are sexually undifferentiated. And I initially assumed that it was the Y chromosome that coded for development of the penis and other secondary sex characteristics. No, that's not true. It's all downstream effects of testosterone. The only thing the Y chromosome does is it determines whether you develop testes or an absence of a Y chromosome, oh. ovaries, during that early period of fetal development. That's interesting. Okay, so in a genetic male with complete androgen insensitivity, first six weeks of fetal development look normal, and then they do produce testes, and the testes do produce testosterone, but the androgen receptor doesn't work, so it doesn't bind to anything. So functionally, it's inert. And free-floating testosterone in males can interact with an enzyme called aromatase, so it's aromatized into estrogen, and those low levels of estrogen that are typical in males are enough for the development of female characteristics. It's normally inhibited by testosterone, but in absence of any testosterone, even if you have a Y chromosome, the baby will develop a vagina and be assigned female at birth. So that's interesting wow. too, because you know people criticize the binary sex idea and say it's a social construct, it's assigned at birth, it's an arbitrary physician rating. <laughs> you know, obviously, it's not arbitrary. In 99.9% .9 of cases, there's complete overlap between genetic sex, phenotypic sex based on external genitalia, hormonal sex, but in some of these intersex disorders, they are dissociable. So you can have a genetic male identified female at birth and then raised as a girl. So this is in a way a more perfect case than the twin study because in the twin study, everyone knew that at least for the first couple weeks or months up to the circumcision, this was a boy. And even the social constructivist could counter, well, they weren't, Brenda wasn't really raised as a girl because everyone knew in the back of their mind that she's secretly a boy. So maybe she's tomboyish because they were treating her different in these unconscious ways. Yeah. But with CAIS, they're genetically male, they're raised as female, they don't even know anything's wrong with them because again, perfectly healthy female genitalia. So then you might think they're gonna live their lives as prepubescent girls because they don't have any testosterone, they're not gonna go through male puberty, but they don't have ovaries, how are they gonna go through female puberty? But it turns out that low level of estrogen and progesterone that males have is enough for the development of female secondary sex characteristics. Wow. It just normally is inhibited by testosterone. So then these girls will start growing breasts, fat will redistribute around the hips, other female secondary sex characteristics, but they won't ever get their period because they don't have ovaries. Wow. So a girl with CAIS, even though they're genetically male, here I'm using the term girl, and I think that would be appropriate. They're gonna identify as girls. They're even overwhelmingly attracted to men, exclusively heterosexual, and identify as women, but they are essentially infertile women, and they don't find out until they're 15, 16, have never gotten a period. They go to the doctor to see what's wrong, and they find out that they don't have ovaries, they have testes inside their abdomen that never descended. That's crazy. What, what percentage of the population does this hit? Complete androgen insensitivity. I can't remember. I think there's another intersex condition that is similar to this that um, a guy from my trans support group, trans man, female to, to presenting male uh, support group, had where he had XY chromosomes, but he developed like a normal female. Um, so I think it is androgen insensitivity that he had, but um, it's interesting the variation of DSDs or intersex conditions that I've run across within the, the support groups. And you can also kind of see the level of sexual dimorphism between um, the different conditions. So like in my case, you know, I lucked out because my dad and mom are pretty tall, so um, I don't know. I I I definitely have some insecurities because I know that I'm not as dimorphic as obviously you know natal males, but um, even some of the trans guys they they are more rare. I've noticed like these conditions where it's uh, like a full on intersex condition. It's not just prenatal hormone exposure. Um, they do have a bit more of a resemblance of they're either actually male or they have more dimorphic traits like their jaw is a bit more not and again I say this because there's some males that are not even that dimorphic too so there's a spectrum but um, there's there's a somewhat of a I don't know how to put it I don't want to say hierarchy but the same kind of dating uh, um, dynamics uh, between 
heterosexuals uh, applies within uh, the trans space too, or as far as like the male dom dominance hierarchy, the more masculine, you know, phenotypically a trans guy is, the more that he's going to have access. If, if, I mean, I think he, regardless of what his sexuality is, but especially if he's straight identified, but, um, so anyways, I just, yeah, it's interesting that I've noticed that. And, and it, I've also noticed too, that, um, not always, but the more dimorphic and masculine a, a trans guy is, the more likely he is to identify as straight, where the less, the more androgynous looking the trans guy still is, the more likely he is to identify as bisexual or pansexual or even gay. So I think that kind of correlates somewhat and has something to do with the level of masculinization versus feminization, either of the brain or the entire body as well. Um, that the less masculinized uh, one is, the more likely they are to identify not just as male, but as either bi, pan, or gay. And the reverse is true. Activity, definitely less than one in 10,000. Yeah, okay, okay. There's still quite a few, that would be shocking. Right. So what that tells us, it's not genetics alone. It's prenatal hormones during a specific critical window of brain development that seems to determine gender identity and sexual orientation. And there's a couple other intersex disorders that we can use to hone in on that hypothesis further. All right, guys. Yeah, he goes into a bunch of other examples, which are equally fascinating. So highly recommend checking out the entire episode at the Michaela Peterson uh, podcast YouTube channel. I'll go ahead and link it in the description. So I just wanted to put that out there because I know that there's a lot of controversy and a lot of opinions that are floating around right now about what's going on with the, the trans uh, politics and you know transitioning kids and all that stuff and um, I think it's complicated and he goes at uh, later in the video he does talk about the issues with transitioning uh, children before they go through their first puberty uh, so it's definitely still complex even though uh, there's evidence that this is uh, innate and unchangeable so all right I hope that was interesting if you guys have any uh, thing you want to contribute feel f free to comment uh, and feel also feel free to also subscribe like and share and I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Peace